Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. Let's begin reading here in verse number 15. The Bible said, And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves some victuals. Vittles. I told you last week, I wish Brother Archer was here. I told you last week the Bible has a southern flavor. Daniel used the word cogitations that, that no northerner has ever heard. <laughs> and uh, Matthew and Paul and the rest uses the word vittles. Amen. Vict victuals are. No, just, I had to put that plug in there, you know. But that was a Brother Archer thing. And he's not here to appreciate it. All right. So they went to buy some food. They went to buy some food is what the Bible said. Verse 16, but Jesus said unto them, they need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled and they took up the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men. And that's why we know there was more there just beside the 5,000 men. The Bible said beside the women and children. So there was quite a crowd, quite a crowd there that day. Now, this must be considered, this particular miracle must be considered one of the most important events in the life of the Lord. I say that based upon it's recorded. It's the only miracle recorded in all four of the Gospels. All four of the Gospels. All the Gospel writers mention it, and it's necessary. If you really want to understand this miracle, it's very necessary for you to read all accounts of this particular miracle in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, first of all, it was a planned intervention. It was a planned intervention. In verse number 19, the Bible said he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves. Everything Christ did was always in order. There's a, there's a lesson to learn, and there's so many lessons in this particular miracle as I read all accounts in all the four Gospels. Uh, a lesson of an orderly Savior. It teaches us the importance of being orderly, not only in our lives, but in our services for the Lord. And everything that we do, be orderly. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 14, in verse number 40, all things be done how? Decently and in order. And in order. So there's not chaos. Now, what do you mean by decently in order? Well, at this particular instance right here, Jesus had them all sit down. He had the audience seated before he performed the miracle. And if you read the account in Mark, he had them sit down by 150s. 150s. One hundreds and fifties. If you read the account in Luke, it was by fifties in Luke chapter number nine, verse number 14. So in putting all of them together, he had two rows of 50 making a hundred. I don't think the Bible ever contradicts itself. I don't think so. And so we have all of that. Now, in, in, in case you're wondering why he did that, if Jesus just would have taken the fish and the loaves and turned them into many, then there'd been a frenzy, everybody trying to get their, to get their plate get their part. So Jesus does everything in order. And by the way, it does not make the miracle look beggared. In other words, it's a, it's a noted miracle. They were all sitting down. They saw the loaves. They saw the fishes. And they saw more and more and more coming out of those two. Amen. All Jesus is looking for is for you to give. It goes from our hands to his hand. And then look at the, look at the rewards that we have. Look at the rewards. So there's a lot of lessons right here. Here's a, the, the, the crowd, they're all, they need to notice the magnitude of the miracle and indeed a miracle it was. I, I was thinking though, as I was reading and listening to some commentators about this particular miracle, uh, I had to conclude there was a lot of unregenerate minds out there on the miracle. Unregenerate minds talking about the miracle. They always love to speak down a miracle. It wasn't long ago we were preaching on Jonah and the fish that swallowed Jonah. We believe that. That was a miracle. We, we believe it. Yes, we do. We believe it. And we believe that Jonah lived. He was spat out on the bank. 
and he actually got his commission. His commission was confirmed. He went and did exactly what God told him to do. Well, here is a literal miracle, but liberals try to speak it down. Liberal interpreters say the crowd probably each brought a lunch, but didn't want to say anything because they didn't have enough to share with others. So probably most of them had a lunch. Let me tell you something, folks. Liberals use the word if and probability much too often. If, what if? I don't know how many times people's come to me after I've been pastoring now for over 40 years. People come and uh, talk to me and they'll say, well, what if so-and-so? I say, well, it doesn't matter. But what if? It doesn't matter. If the Bible says it happened, it happened. So we're not going to put an if or a possibility or a probability in there. And sometimes I'll entertain it, but uh, I, want you to, I want you to see how important that this Bible is. It's our standard. It's the Word of God. If God said it, it happened. If God said it didn't happen, then it didn't happen. Amen. If He says this is the way to salvation, there's only one way. There's not a multitude of ways. Jesus said, By me, all men, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All right. So uh, they try to dumb down the miracle. Amen. And uh, God took what, what God did. Uh, even back in Genesis, in creation, he took a handful of dirt and made man. And if he did that, and I know he did that, then how hard is it to believe that he took five loaves and two fishes and fed well over 5,000 people? All right, there's a lesson right here. There's a lesson. Sometimes it is infinitely easier to believe the Bible than to accept the teaching of those who are supposed to be it's interpreters. Just believe the Bible. And I think the emphasis goes from this place several times that God has given you a mind. You are to pick up this wonderful Word of God. You're to read the Word of God. And God will give you the exact same thing, the truth, that He gives anybody else. Amen. And you make your decision based upon the Word of God. And pray that you'll have speakers that will convey the Word of God as it should be conveyed and preached. All right, so we find it was very orderly. It was very orderly. It was a planned intervention. Not only that, it was a perfect illustration. In verse number 19 and 20, the Bible says, And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and they were filled and they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. He took, he took. Someone just needed to give him something, amen? Of course, God could have conjured it up out of thin air if he wanted to, Christ could have done that. But uh, it's just like rolling the stone away. Uh, when men can do something, God could have flipped that stone off any time. But God's not in the business of uh, performing circus miracles. Uh, the men removed the stone, amen? I mean, the, uh, the, the, the uh, men rolled the stone on the thing, Christ Jesus come out of it, amen? He, he's, uh, the, the miracles, miracles uh, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ never has produced faith, but they actually get people's attention. And when I say miracles have not produced faith, you know what I mean by that? The Bible says, so then faith cometh how? By hearing, how does hearing? by the Word of God. The Word of God itself produces the faith you need to believe Christ. So get in the Word of God and believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, so um, the world needs what we have, don't they? Now, we're talking about uh, a perfect illustration in verse 19 and 20. He took, he blessed, and he gave, and they all did eat, and they were all filled, and were filled. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all says that they were all filled. John puts something in there a little different. He says, as much as they wanted. They were all filled, and then John says, as much as they wanted. Now, there's a lesson. There's a lesson. Jesus Christ is preparing his disciples and us of our mission of carrying the bread of life to a hungry world. And when the task seems so impossible and so hard, we are to look at him and bring to him what we have and never, never forget we stand between an all-sufficient Savior and a very needy world. Never forget 
the world needs what we have. And what do we have? Then we, do we have the gospel message. Those of you that are born again, you know what salvation is. If you'll take your Bibles and hold them there in Matthew and just go over to Romans chapter 1 real quick. I think you know where we're going. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. We have something the world needs. And God depends on us to distribute this bread of life, this truth, to a lost and dying world. That's why here at Faith Baptist Church, we believe in missionaries. We support several missionaries, 54 altogether, 54 altogether of, uh, eight of, uh, of uh, children's homes plus individual missionaries going to different countries. But we believe that. Now, we don't stop there. We believe that we're supposed to be active as well. You've, you've seen churches, I'm sure that you've been in church buildings that have signs up. When you leave, you're entering into your mission field. When you leave here, you're entering into your mission field. I walked in one church one time and had a sign on the door coming in that says you're entering in your mission field. You're entering in your mission field. Did you know that you and I both know that there's sheep and goats? We know that. We know that. There's sheep and goats. There are some lost people that come into church seeking to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. They want. I did. I, as a lost person, I said, surely I can find out. Yeah, Brother Cliff did. Surely I can find out who Christ is and what he's done for me and how to go to heaven if I go to church. Well, that's not always the case in all churches, amen? But I promise you, you come in this place, you'll hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll hear exactly what we're supposed to be distributing. And the Bible does say here in Romans chapter number 1, verse 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17 says, For therein, for therein, within, therein, within the gospel, therein, within the gospel, is revealed the righteousness of God, amen, the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. That's from one truth to another truth. Right here in this book, we have one truth revealed. We accept that truth. God gives us another truth. That's from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So how in the world is God going to reveal the power of the gospel and salvation unless the gospel is preached according to thus saith the Lord? Thus saith the Lord. Uh, a lot of people get up behind pulpits today, and I've said this before, they get up and they hammer on the gospel. The gospel this, the gospel that, but never take time to explain the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ. He is good news, period, from Genesis to Revelation. But there is a crux of the gospel that you and I need to preach every time we get up or teach. And that's how the Bible mentions it over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in the first four verses. How that Jesus died according to the scripture. I can go back in the Old Testament scripture and find out according to the scripture how that he was to die. He was to die as a sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the world. I, I see that. I look in the Old Testament. I go to the book of Hebrews. It explains it some more. That Jesus Christ's sacrifice was better than the Old Testament sacrifice. The blood of Christ was better than the blood of bulls and goats. Only the blood of Christ can wash away sin. Only Christ could totally eradicate sin. If it was left up to Old Testament sacrifices, it had to be done every year according to Hebrews chapter number 10, verse 1 and 2. It had to be done every year, every year. And what did that bring about in the minds of people every time it was done? It, had, it brought about their sin, but it also caused them to remember, we got to do it again next year. We've got to do it again next year. But when Jesus Christ died once and for all on the cross of Calvary and shed his blood after being beaten and spit upon and, and, and hanged on a tree and, and, and saying it's finished and Father forgive them for they know not what they do. And he gave up the ghost and he died. He went in the tomb and three days later he come again, uh, rose again, proving it was all true. That is the gospel, amen. And that's what you're going to believe in order to go to heaven. Amen. And he's not forcing it on either one of you here this morning. He's putting it out there plain, as plain as a nose on your face, saying, here is what the gospel is. Here is salvation. I, Jesus said, am the propitiation for your sin. Propitiation means satisfactory sacrifice. Jesus said, I satisfy the demands of a holy God. 
God required a perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world, I became a man and went to Calvary. And there on Calvary, God poured out his wrath on me for you, for you. And since God did judge Christ for our sins, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19 that he would not impute your trespasses unto you. Why? Because he imputed them to Christ 2,000 years ago and is satisfied with the payment that God, uh, he's satisfied with the payment his dear son made. That's why the Bible said he's a propitiation. Propitiation means satisfactory sacrifice. That's what you and I are to be handing out to a lost and dying world. We're handing out the gospel, handing out the living bread as it were. You know, people in this world <sighs> remain hungry. They re you know, people can come to church and they'll leave still hungry. I've often wondered why. I have really, I've wondered why. I wonder if people seek, seeking and searching for salvation. And he's right here in front of you, right in this book. I mean, you're, you're looking at the very character of God. Jesus said in John 14, if you've seen the, uh, me, you've seen the Father. I'm showing you the character of God. I am who I say I am. I am God the Son. I'm come, a perfect sacrifice to die for the sins of the world. But people in the world will remain hungry. I'll tell you why I believe. It's because that they waste their time counting their problems and pursuing their own interests. And maybe, maybe one of you are like that today. You came to church because mama asked you to or daddy asked you to. Maybe you're here just, uh, just to satisfy a loved one. But see, I don't believe that. I don't always believe that's true because you could have went somewhere else. I'm convinced that, I'm convinced every time I open this Bible and preach that somebody's going to get a hold of some truth. I believe that. If I didn't believe that, I'd quit. Amen. I, I would. So, um, while you can, listen. Listen. Amen. Now, only John, if you'll turn out, I, I encourage you to read all of these accounts. Uh, we read in Matthew, but Matthew did not record the 50s and the 100s. Uh, Luke and Mark record a little bit more than Matthew records. You go over to the book of John in John chapter 6. In, in John chapter 6, in verse number 1 and following, John is the only one that reveals actually who it was that provided the loaves and fishes. And that was a little lad. A little lad. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how he heard of it unless he was just listening to the disciples talk to Jesus about needing some food. And they're so faint. They, we can't send them away without some kind of food. And so Jesus, everything was planned. We said it was a divine intervention. Everything was planned. Everything was in order. Because from this, from this feeding the 5,000 plus was coming one of the greatest lessons that John ever recorded about the bread of life eating and drinking Christ. Uh, it, so it, it's John brings all of this into, in, into light. Um, so in verse number nine of John chapter number six, John reveals it was a lad that brought the food. Again, Christ needed someone willing to give what they had. I don't have much. Give what you have. But I don't know a lot of scripture like you do. Give what you have. I promise you this, if you're saved, if you know you're saved, you're not second guessing this salvation. If you know you're going to heaven, I promise you, you have enough in you to tell somebody else how to go to heaven. If there's only one way to get saved, that's Christ. And that's not an arrogant attitude. That's just stating facts, a standard that Jesus Christ is the only way. If you know that to be true, then you have something to give to someone. Take your Bibles, if you will. And here's another lesson that we're going to learn. 
God is just looking for people to give what they have. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This, this, this feeding the 5,000 is full of lessons, full of applications, lessons for life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Bible said, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record. Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. Now verse 3 is kind of tricky. It's not tricky. The Bible's not tricky. I shouldn't have said that. But unless you're really looking at the Bible, you say, what do you mean their power and beyond their power? If I give beyond my power, how in the world can I give something that I don't have? That's a good question. That's a legitimate question, by the way. How can I give something I don't have? First of all, I'm going to give what I do have. This particular case, in handing out the gospel, I have myself. I have myself. And so I can make a decision that, that I'm going to give out what I have. I'm going to give out what I have. And the Bible goes on to say, if we will first give what we have, then we will be able to give what we don't have. You know, I can give the gospel out to my neighbor. And the more I give the gospel out, because you know, over the years, and, and over the years, I, I would read Jeremiah when Jeremiah was uh, in prison and Paul was in prison. I would read how God brought them people for Jeremiah to witness to and brought Paul people for Paul to witness to. Yeah. I thought, how, how, how is that possible? I mean, I know anything's possible with God, but we're commanded to go out two by twos. We're, co we're commanded to go out and, and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark proclaims it, 16, 15. Acts 1 proclaims it. Matthew 28 proclaims it. Uh, send them out two by two, send out the 70, send out, God's always sending people out, 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 and out, and out. But i tell you what, I, I became overjoyed. I used to think about that as a young preacher. But it's hardly a day goes by. Hardly. Now, there has days gone by. Hardly a day goes by that someone doesn't call me, text me, or come to this church and sit in my office wanting to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think God's blessing me in my old age. I don't have to get out here as much like Brother Chris Hively does, see? God bringing in people. Of course, it's still my responsibility to go out, isn't it? But God brings in people to hear the gospel. And so you get to give beyond your power. There's a, there's a principle behind that. If you'll notice in uh, uh, verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 8, This they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So you give what you have. All right, now, there's another, it's the same principle over in Luke, if you will. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Brother Donnell did a great, excellent job on giving this morning. And if you did not hear that, you need to get a copy of that. It was very, very well put together, very well scripturally supported, and uh, you need to get a hold of it on uh, giving. But in verse 38 of Luke chapter 6, the Bible said, Give and it shall be given to you. So give. If I give what I have, God will give me more to give. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, just how much do you want to give away? Not only of your money, but how much of you want to get away of yourself and your time? The, the more you give, God said he would give it. I don't have time to do anything. I don't have time to do anything. I watch 14 football games a week, and I, I play golf, and I bowl, and I, and I, I coach a little league team. I don't have time to do anything. And go fishing, yeah, go fishing. 
I don't do that. Give and it shall be given to you. you. You give. You give of yourself. You give of your time. Give of your talent. Give of your treasure. Give and God said, it's a principle of God. It's a, it's a principle, the law of sowing and reaping. If I sow, I'm going to get. If I don't sow, I'm not going to get. And so we, we find that great lesson right here in John in the feeding of the 5,000. All Christ needed was someone to give what he had. And the little lad gave what he had. And God, God blessed it. Amen. God blessed it. Now notice here in John chapter 6 verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. Jesus followed this great miracle with himself, being the bread of life. If you'll notice in John chapter 6, verse 35, and Jesus said unto them, this same crowd actually followed him and they wanted more. <clears throat> Jesus said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. You ought to read that for yourself again and just play on every word there. If you come to Christ, you'll never hunger. If you eat of Christ, you will never hunger. You eat of this living bread, you will never hunger. And if you drink of him, the water of life, you will never thirst. These are promises of an almighty God. John chapter number four, the woman at the well. He said, if you would have asked, I would have given you the water of life. That's what he said to her. Give me this water that I thirst not. She was still thinking about physical water. Jesus was talking about himself. In John chapter number six, Jesus speaking of himself. Never. That's why I have a difficult time Precious, precious congregation, I have a difficult time of people or anybody in church, any church worker. Somebody comes up worried about their salvation. Worried, not sure if they're saved or not. I don't know where you come from, but I know where I come from. And it was very prevalent where I come from. People that were dealing with their salvation just wasn't sure they were really saved. And then the workers at the altar or some church leaders would tell them, it happened to me is why I can say it's honest, it's true. It happened to me. Church workers would tell them, oh, everybody doubts. It's all right to doubt. You just need some verses of assurance. If you read this scripture right here, he said, if you eat of me, you'll never hunger. What does never mean? If you, if you drink of me, you will what? Ne what does never mean? Never. You'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. You'll, you'll, you'll never thirst. Never. Never means never. If we're to take God's word literally, if we're to take God as what he has to say, my dear friend, I'm going to tell you something. The ones that are dealing with all of that constant doubt and the workers that are trying to... I was in a meeting in North Georgia of probably 600 people, six, 700, I don't know. It was a big crowd. And a preacher got up there when I was dealing with my own salvation, as Wendy Bagwell said, that's the truth of my hand up, you know. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. I understand that. But a preacher got up there and he said, it's okay to doubt. He said, if there's anybody here that says they've never doubted, I doubt whether you were ever saved. That's what he said. So I went home feeling a little bit better. I thought, whew, everybody doubts because that preacher said so. Until I got in the Word of God for myself. And what, what did I say earlier? Sometimes it's better to get in the Word of God infinitely better than to listen to some interpreter try to explain it. He was trying to explain away this doubt. And I got in the Bible and I found some verses like these things I write unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. You see, a child of God knowing where they're going is joy and contentment and peace and happiness. 
if a, I, I talked to a, a, a man up in a, a, a store, grocery store parking lot, and we were just talking about salvation. I said, man, it's good to know you're saved. He said, and he was a lot older than I was, and I'm pretty old. He's a lot older than I was. He said, oh, no, 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 young man. He said, not everybody knows. Nobody can know till they get there. And I said, oh, sir, that must be a miserable life. That must be a miserable life. He didn't understand that. And I wasn't going to take him to task as far as uh, reprimand an older fellow like that, but I did explain that a man trusts Christ. He, he's sealed into the day of redemption. And he can know these things. Well, that's what Christ wants us to know. We're, if we're to hand off the truth, let's hand it all off. If Christ entrusts us with the truth, let's hand it all off. Amen. Let's, let's hand it all. Let's don't hand it in portions. Let's hand it all. Let, let's hand it all. And let's go through it all. Uh, salvation is real. It's salvation is of the Lord. You didn't have anything to do with it. Christ did it for you. He asked you to believe it. He gives you a choice. He asked you to believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And he tells them to believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever what? Believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Make sure you have enough about Christ they can believe with an intelligent decision based on Christ. Amen. All right, let's go over here and I'm closing right here. John chapter 6. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets... And they shall all be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard, hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. So it's our responsibility to make sure they hear. It's the Spirit of God's responsibility to make sure they learn or enlightened. Okay? We can, all we can do is pass off what God's given us to give to people. And the Bible goes on to say, um, verse 47, uh, 48, I am that bread of life. And then he was talking to the religious people, which is a, sometimes a mission field, isn't it? Your father did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread, verse 50, which has come down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I'm the, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And then the Bible said the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man. Isn't this something that comes right after the feeding of the 5,000? If you will eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Unless you eat his flesh and drink his blood, you have no life. That's what the Bible says. Verse 54. He's not playing around here now, folks. Look at it. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath, er, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Not only do we eat and drink for salvation, but we keep eating and we keep drinking the rest of our lives on this earth. The Bible said in verse 57, As the living Father has sent me and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? What does he mean? Eat his flesh and drink his blood. It's a hard saying. And the Bible said in verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What? And if you shall see the Son of Man ascended up where he was before. Verse 63, here's your answer. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. 
But there's some of you here, some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Verse 66 from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Now, we just got through with a sermon saying that you need to eat the flesh of Christ and drink his blood. You and I both know that that's impossible. We know that's impossible. So Jesus explains it in verse 63. And he says, the words I speak unto you, they're spirit and in truth. If I eat Christ, he's that living bread, then I will never hunger if I drink his blood, I will never thirst at living water. I will never, ever, ever thirst. Listen to me, folks. We, those of you that has partaken of him, you will never thirst for the knowledge of salvation as long as you live life on this earth. Never. Never. And the Bible said it was so hard that many of his disciples went back and walked no more. John chapter number 8 says a disciple is one that continues in the Word, is one that does the Word of Christ, continues in the Word, but if you quit, you cease being a disciple. Just because you're called a disciple does not mean you're saved. That's right. It doesn't mean that. John chapter 8, if you continue in my Word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will what? Make you free. Make you free. So we're disciples, we're learning... Until we come to that full knowledge of the truth, we accept Christ, and then we continue learning. We keep learning. A lot of people, after hearing preaching like this, are hearing that there's only one way to heaven. It's only Christ. It's not what you can do. It's not what you can say. It's not what anything you could bring to God. It's what God has brought to you. And you accepting that truth. And because of that, that saying's too hard, preacher. There's got to be something I have to do. And you know what happens? Many will walk away. Many will walk away. And you won't see them anymore. But some will stay. So there's something to that, John chapter 6. My friend, Jesus is the, the living bread. He fed the 5,000 teaching us that we should take the message of the living bread to a lost and dying world. And I hope you do. If you're here without Christ, I trust that you will think about what's been said and make a decision for him before it's too late. Let's stand to our feet, please.